Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Horror Analysis. My name is Drew, and I'll be your guide through this course. Course of analyzing horror. Not work by work, but as a genre itself. Um, I want to discuss many things in this course. I should be able to do all of these. Um, I have a list here. What I want to discuss uh, first, A, monsterness. The what is needed f to be horror. Which, as Noel Carroll, one of the people we're going to be talking about, um, is going to discuss is tied intrinsically to monsterness. Um, second, the horror tale. What are the elements of the horror tale? what is necessary for a horror tale and what you find in often in horror tales um, what are the devices often used in horror tales history of horror as a genre from the beginnings in uh, the romantic era up to present um, through books and plays and music and movies and all sorts of things. <laughs> um, horror anthropology. This is Those first three sections are going to be big sections. Horror anthropology is a very small section, but it's something I want to expand upon, and it's something that should be expanded upon and hopefully that will be interactive. I want uh, participation from you out there to help me with horror anthropology because it's a great field of study ready to be developed. Yeah, let's just jump on that. And non-narrative horror, which is something else we're going to discuss. Um, Narrative means stories, so non-narrative would be non-story horror. Not as in non-fiction horror, like horrific things happening, or true-life ghost stories, if you believe in such, but non-narrative, non-storytelling type. Um, horror music or horror paintings. Um, you can see this the painting of this is, uh, oh, it's Cronus eating his, Saturn devouring his son. Um, it's by Goya. This is also the cover of one of the books we're going to be using in the course. Um, what I won't be discussing, what I do not want to discuss at all, is the psych psychology of horror, or if you like, the sociology of horror. I don't want to address the question of why horror? Or as my mom likes to put it, why horror? You're so, you know, you're such a good boy. Why are you interested in horror? Like, no one ever asks why comedy. It's, you know, no one ever asks why chick flicks. No one ever asks why romance or, you know, or those stories. You know, the dorky guy in high school. He gets up his courage and he goes and asks out the popular girl. And she breaks his heart through her callousness and he's broken hearted those stories no one asks why those stories and I wish they would because those are even more disturbing to me than you know a zombie baby that clawed its way out of its mother and is now playing the entrails um, of the mother that would have birthed it if it were alive you know that's I'm, I can deal with that. 
it freaks me out. It gives me nightmares, sure, but I can deal with that. The the emotional turmoil stuff. Oh, that's just so much. So unnecessary. Um, I don't ask why horror, because horror is. It is. There is horror in every society. Every healthy society. Maybe there's societies that failed because they didn't have horror. I'm not going to make that claim either way. But a society that's healthy has a horror... Um, writers, you know, horror writers and horror audience. And rabid. They're... they're fiends for the stuff um I, I mean that's a mark of a healthy society that's not a defect in the society that there's um, people who are interested in uh, watching horrible things happen to fake people um I won't go as far to say snuff movies or something are healthy for a society uh or part of a healthy society, but I think horror movies certainly are. Um, so, yeah, that's... I don't want to answer or talk about that question too much. Um, after this video, I'm not going to at all. The books we're going to be discussing, they do talk about it kind of a bit. Um, well... Two and a half, three of them do. Um, two and a half. Um, well, call it a solid one because it's only half of one and half of another. Um, but those aren't the sections I'm going to be going over. I to read about them bores me. It's full of very a lot of psycho jargon. There's some. I'll be pointing out things to you as we go along for those of you interested in the question of why horror and the question of uh, psychology of horror and why we like horror as people why otherwise rational human beings want to watch you know, slashers and monsters devouring cities and such that just doesn't bother that's not a question that interests me in any way I don't have a problem with... I don't need to ask that question. People who are healthy like to watch slashers and people. You can disagree, but you wouldn't really be looking up this video if you did. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any desire for that one. Let's move from there. <laughs> to the sources that we're going to be discussing. Uh, first, um, I guess in order of importance, no, not really, but uh, first I want to discuss is Philosophy of Horror by Noel Carroll. That's this one here. And I'm going to grab it out here. Um, this was written in 1990 by Philosopher of Art and Philosopher extraordinaire Noel, Carroll, Noel, Noel Carroll. Um, he's most well known for philosophy of art. He is of course a philosophy of many things but most uh, most well known for his philosophy of art. I have it here actually. Um, he's the only philosopher of art that really put effort into philosophy of horror. Um, thus far. Oh, excuse me. I have to drink my boiling water. Um, yep, yeah, he's written many books on philosophy of art, philosophy of film. Um, he's done stuff. He's done stuff across the board in, in philosophy of art. Philosophy of horror is. I guess what he's most well known for. Um, philosophy of Horror or Paradoxes of the Heart. Paradoxes of the Heart part of the book is the part of the book that deals with 
psychology for her. I've skimmed through it. I haven't read enough about it to teach in the course, and it's not an interest of mine, so I'm not going to teach that part. But a good third of the book is devoted to it. Um, I recommend this for the course. I did look it up today. Um, it was available on Amazon used for like 17 bucks, um, new for 20, 42 bucks, or you can get the ebook of it for 32 bucks. I I bought it used for about 15 bucks on Amazon 10 years ago. Well, maybe not 10 years ago. Maybe seven years ago. Um, I've read through it. Well, I've read through the part that I'm interested in two, three times. Um, well, plus for this course, another time. Next is Dance Macabre by Stephen King. Um, this is in the version I would like you to get. Um, the version I'd like you to get is this version here, because it includes a new essay, What's Scary? This is the one that came out in 2009. Um, I have the old version. Actually, this is the British version. I bought it in, in England. It cost £5.99. So, um, whatever that is in American. I was able to find it. Um, I do have this version as well. But I have this version on audiobook. And the audiobook's in my car, so I, don't, I can't flash it up at you right now. Um, I did look around for this. Um, today on Amazon. New was 11.50. Used was one cent. Plus four dollars shipping and handling, but one cent. Um, there's a lot of, of one cent books um, out of the ones that I have for course stuff. I don't know when I when I used to order on Amazon a lot and did the one cent stuff a lot. I think you could, could do. Uh, pardon me. I think you could do one, like five one cent books from one vendor and then just pay one lot of shipping and handling. I don't know if that's still the case. I don't know what Amazon's policies are. Um, so don't quote me. And don't tell Amazon. Because <laughs> they're not going to listen to me. Um, but this version has what's scary. This book was written in 1981. Well, this version was written in 1981. Um, this version was written in 2009 and includes What's Scary. It sort of updates you from 1981's version to 2009, which is nice for the history of horror section. This section has quite a big history of horror um, part to it. It essentially is his view of horror from 1950 to 1980. Um, his view of that 30 years of horror, which were quite an eventful 30 years. Of course, he misses out on the 80s, um, but we do have other things to help us out with that as well. The third, Supernatural Horror and Literature. Uh, this is H.P. Lovecraft. This is a Dover book, so you can get it pretty cheap. Um, I got it, well, I got it, like, on sale for less than eight ninety five when I worked at Borders. It even has the Borders sticker still on there. Rest in peace, Borders. Um, I did look this one up today. You can get it f new from the, for three thirty nine, or used for a penny, or $1 for the e-book. Um, did Dance have an e-book? I think it did. I don't don't remember it though. Um, let's see. Okay, well, that is also going to be the beginnings of our flo um, horror history, as well as um, other stuff about 
monsterness and what is horror plot, etc. Um, in the introduction, he has a bit on it, but mostly it's horror history, and we're going to utilize it as such. Um, the last one I want to talk about extensively is House of Leaves by Danilevsky. Um, it's a novel. It is a great book. It is a great ghost story. Um, this is the only info I have on the horror anthropology, the section D. And you want to know how much it is in that book? This much. I photocopied it. My, uh, I let a friend borrow the book, so I don't have it. But I do have the, the pertinent information. From the bottom of this page to... Oh, goodness gracious. Okay. From the bottom of this page, this half a paragraph, on page 356 to here on to page 357. Less than three paragraphs. But it sparked an idea about horror anthropology. And I was like, man, someone should really focus on this. And has anybody? No. Should s lots of people? Yes, that's why I'm going to toss it out to you folks out there. Um, soon. <laughs> um, Dan Lesky. I did find used versions of this one on Amazon. I didn't find an audiobook. Or sorry, not an audiobook, a uh, ebook. This is one of the weirdest books I've ever read, so I wouldn't even, I couldn't even recommend it on ebook if it's available. Well, it must. It started off on uh, computer, though, didn't it? Um, I found this twelve forty eight for a new copy, used eight bucks or thereabouts, plus shipping and handling, of course. Um, it is by far one of the weirdest books I've ever read. Um, visually, it is the weirdest book I've ever read. Story-wise, it's top ten. Um, actually, not much has beaten it story-wise. Um, Warren Ellis beats it because he's very, very weird. Um, some Hunter S. Thompson beats it also because he's very, very weird. Um, Joe Hill beat it with horns because, oh my god, that was so twisted. And that's the only other one that's really horror. Um, I missed seeing Joe Hill on Saturday because I slept too late and I didn't have money to buy his new book, Nos for a uh, 2. Um, I would have gone to the store and had him sign it if I had money to buy the book, but I didn't. And guess who was there? I could have had him sign my Dance Macabre. Would have been cool for this course, wouldn't it? Joe Hill is Stephen King's son, by the way. Pardon me. For anyone who didn't know. Um, anyway, the other books I'm talking about are the Feast of Fear, Bare Bones, Kingdom of Fear, and Fear Itself. These are the Underwood and um, Miller books. Ooh, what is that? Oh, well. Um, Kingdom of Fear. Uh, 17 essays on the Master of Horror by prominent writers, critics, and filmmakers. The World of Stephen King. Um, this has some really good history of horror stuff in it. Uh, Bare Bones, Conversations on Terror with Stephen King. Um, Chuck Miller and Tim Underwood scoured like newspapers and magazines. Mostly magazines. Mostly a lot of Playboy and Penthouse for some reason. Uh, I guess in the 80s he just got a lot of got a lot of interviews with Playboy and Penthouse. Um, and compiled them into one book. Uh, two books, actually. The other one is this. Conversations with Stephen King, Feast of Fear. Um, there's some good stuff in this, too. 
those are the three I'm going to be mostly using. Uh, another one I recommend to read. I recommend all these to read. These are very... They're not overly academic. They're very user-friendly. Um, Stephen King's Dance is also very user-friendly. For a non-fiction book, it's not too scholarly. It's not too uh, dry. But you'd expect. It's Stephen King. Um, so anyway, Fear Itself is the on the early works of Stephen King. Um, is this? I don't think this is even compiled by Underwood, is it? Yes, it is. It's edited by Tim Underwood and Chuck Miller. Um, it's just not on the cover. Oh, well. Um, Underwood and Miller. They're the compilers of Stephen King's non-books, I guess. Um, but very readable. I recommend all of those if you're looking for good books. I'm going to be using them more as source material for the course. Um, other sources, I, of course, are I'm going to be using from the internet as well, but um, and anywhere I can find it, and for some places, because I'm going to struggle, I'm sure. But the big three are these three. Uh, Dance Macabre, Stephen King, Philosophy of Horror, Noel Carroll, and supernatural horror and literature. Uh, Noel Carroll is the one we're going to jump into first. Um, he's going to talk about monsterness when we go into our first section. Pardon me. Oh, sorry. Um, these four. Before I, before I move away from that, uh, these four all available on Amazon. I did look them up today. All four of them were available used for one penny. <laughs> um, plus, you know, five bucks shipping, four bucks shipping handling each time, but a penny. Um, Kingdom of Fear was twelve ninety four used. Feast of Fear was twelve thirty seven used. Bare Bones was six dollars used, and Fear itself was eighteen sixty new. I said used all those times. I meant to say new all those times. Twelve ninety four new. Twelve thirty seven new. Let's go. Twelve ninety four new. Twelve thirty seven new. Six dollars new in paperback. I got the hardcover. Um, and eighteen sixty new. I don't know why this one's so expensive. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah. So. next video, I'll be talking about me, which is going to be really rough, but um, you may be asking yourself, or you may have been asking yourself for a while now, what makes me qualified to teach a philosophy of or horror analysis course? Um, I'm not really, but no one else is, and I do have some qualifications, um, which I will go over next video. I would love to teach this. I would love to learn, uh, be in this course as a student, but no one else is teaching it. And the only person that's willing to teach it seems to be me. So I'm going to teach it, and hopefully I won't do too bad of a job. Um, so next time, we're going to talk about me, and then the time after that, we're going to talk about. Monsterness, which is the first section here. There we go. Here. All right, ladies and gentlemen. This was a short one. Um, I'm going to try to keep these under an hour a piece, but this one is under half an hour. But it's an introduction. It's a syllabus in of sorts. If this were a real course, um, I wanted this to be a real course in a classroom type situation where I would give homework and tests and stuff and assign papers. I still have pages of 
notes about, hey, what could I do for papers for this? Um, or book reports, horror book reports, or horror movie reports. Man, that would been that would be so much fun. Um, to you know, assign and participate with and whatnot. And if I were the student, I would think that would be cool too. Um, but I didn't. Part of the reason I'm doing this on video is to find out how much I have. Do I have a semester's worth of content? If I don't, well, I don't have a course. <laughs> um, hopefully I do. I think I do. From the videos that I've done thus far, I think I do. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, I will see you next time on Horror Analysis.